I'm going to be a little repetitive this morning. And um, I'm not going to apologize for being repetitive, for, for going back over some things that we are already familiar with. But I believe that the more we, 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 the more we look at the word of God, the more we find that there are facets, there are aspects to it, there are depths to it that sometimes we overlook. I think most of you know that over the past couple of weeks, something has been very heavily on my mind, on my heart. And it is it is because I am I've been exposed over the past two weeks a little more fully to the reality that there are a great many believers, Christian believers, believers who are in our let me say our our corner or our our who hold our perspective on certain things, who who actually reject the idea that God and Jesus actually live inside of us. I, I kind of, I, I knew that there were people who believed this, but sometimes just by being exposed to something and hearing the things that people say, it brings it more strikingly home to your mind. And so it, it has been on my mind for the past couple of weeks. And um, as, is, as is always the case, I want to share what is on my heart because that is what I'm best able to speak about at the moment. Now, to be, to be honest, one of the, the reasons why we are, we're, we're cautioned, well, I don't know who cautions us, but I know that um, people who are experienced in Christianity usually say we should avoid looking at things that will create skepticism. You know, if, if somebody... If somebody presents is, is sharing false ideas, they say, "Don't expose yourself to it unless you are strong enough to um to resist it." In fact, there's a famous story that I heard in Adventism about a man, some Adventist preacher, who went to have discussions with a man who was a spiritualist, and they say at the end of the the, the discussion. He came away convinced about spiritualism, and the spiritualist was convinced that he was wrong. Both of them went to, to discuss with each other to convince the other, each to convince the other, and both of them succeeded. The spiritualist con convinced the other man about spiritualism, and the other man convinced him that spiritualism was wrong, which is kind of like, it's amusing, but I understand it's a true story. I forget the name of the man that it happened to, but anyway. The point I'm making is I, I, I really believe that we should we should we should we should ex, we should be willing to look at everything. Why? Because you don't know what is true until you examine it. So if somebody says this is true, you should look at it. But I, I also believe that once you have come to understand that something is, is an error, you have looked at it carefully, then it might be it might not be wise to keep on looking at it. Because then now you're in, you're you're wasting time, but the Lord knows that whenever my beliefs are challenged, I always want to go back to the Bible and look again. The reason is that I, I keep I keep wanting to be be sure I'm not making a mistake. Okay, we're we're human, and we're prone to make mistakes, and we're prone to become become carried away by our emotions and our feelings sometimes. So many mornings I go before the Lord and I take some of the things that we believe and I ask him about it. Because, you know, there, there are so many things we believe that people attack. And sometimes it seems like we're such a small group and the, the question comes in your mind, do you think you're the only person or you are the only people who understand truth? For example, our position about sin. We say that sin is more than transgressing the law. So many people say we are wrong. So, so many people are convicted that, you know, salvation is by faith, but your works are involved, your work contributes to that salvation. Can we be wrong? So many people say that it is not Christ himself who lives in us, but it is through the words and the, um, 
as we meditate on those words that we become a part of of, of christ our, our christ christ's thoughts and ideas become a part of us and so many people and some of those people that i consider to be maybe mature in their christian experience they are saying similar kinds of things so it makes me go back and ask the lord please father please direct us because i don't want to be wrong on things that are very important so it's not a question of i'm doubtful but sometimes it's a real question how can it be that so many people are are, are wrong so many people who are who seem to be sincere christians and a few of you a few of us hang on to something that everybody says is wrong so anyway with that preamble what i mean is that i i, I keep going back to the, the bible and looking at things and i want to look at this question this morning of i want to look again at this question that we have battered so much uh which is the question of is it really does god really live inside of us does god really live inside of us and i'm going to look this morning from a perspective from the perspective of the the sanctuary or the temple and i i'd like to entitle the presentation this morning god's dwelling place now as always i'm going to go to the bible and we're going to operate on the basis of looking at what the bible says now the first thing i want to do is to examine or to ask ourselves a question i want i want us to each point that i'm going to make i'm going to try to reinforce this point because sometimes you say this you say the same thing over and over but it is it is how you understand each point that makes a difference what is the purpose of a temple what is the purpose of a temple that's where i want to begin okay now i i i looked at the dictionary i wanted to be sure that um i wanted to hear what people had to say about a temple because i have i have an idea we have an idea but what is the generally understood uh, purpose of a temple well i looked at several dictionaries and they give me the same kind of meaning i'm going to read from the, the cambridge dictionary and it says it is a building used for the worship of a god or gods in some religions it is a building used for the worship of a god now i'm going to i'm going to disagree even though i went to several dictionaries and i found the same same kind of meaning but i think what they what they have done they have they have misunderstood even even these authorities they have misunderstood the intent of a temple yes it has been used um nowadays as a place of worship but even beyond the idea of a place of worship there's something more fundamental to the idea of a temple and that's what i want us to focus on first of all to make sure we get it right you find the meaning in exodus 25 and verse 8 the the the, the true god the, the the god of the bible he made a statement all of us are familiar with it but let's read it again he said specifically to moses and to the, the hebrews and let them make me a sanctuary let them make me a sanctuary as we understand a sanctuary is the other name for the for the place that later was described as the temple same thing the sanctuary it was called a sanctuary a sanctuary means a place where you you take refuge a place where you 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 can go and and stay god says let them make me a sanctuary or, or a house that i may dwell among them the purpose of the sanctuary the purpose of a temple is specifically outlined here by god himself god says the reason for a sanctuary the reason for a, a temple is that he might dwell among people and this is the idea this is the real intent of a temple now a temple is used for worship because of course people believe if god is in this place then they go there to worship even in heathen temples you know their devotees will go there and they will go inside the temple or, or they'll stay outside the temple and they'll bring gifts and so on and they present them at the temple because there is the belief that this place is a special dwelling place of god uh, and they're 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 
there are several examples of this in the Bible. You know, like, for example, when Jacob was traveling to see his uncle Laban, one night he stopped at a place and he, he, made a, he, he used a stone for his pillow. And in the night he had a vision where he saw angels of God ascending and descending. And he got up in the morning and, and he says, surely this is nothing but the house of God. And he anointed the place with oil and it became a sacred place to him. When he was going back there 20 years later, he stopped to worship there. And he, he still operated in a way like he thought the presence of God was at that spot. So the point is, a temple is, is essentially, primarily, I could almost say exclusively, the dwelling place of a God. That is the purpose of a sanctuary. Now, I want us all to, to, to notice that, um, I want us also to notice that the, there, it, it, it tells us something about God. Look at what, what we see in this verse. God says that I may do something, that I may do something. What does God want to do? God wants to live among his people. Okay, God wants, the, 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 we know that this was type. We know that this was illustration, but the illustration is teaching us a lesson. And the lesson we see from the illustration is that God wants to be with his people. God wants to be with his people. Now, of course, they understood that God, in a sense, was in many places. I don't think they, they had a proper understanding of God's omnipresence because they kept focusing on different places. But they, they had an idea that God was a great person and he could be in many places. And God was, was catering to this idea. And God says, I want to live among you. The purpose of the temple was, the intent of the temple was that God desired to be among his people and and beyond the temple itself i want us to look at the point that is being made here the point is that god desires god desires intimate fellowship and personal contact with his people i don't know if you can see what i'm trying to say okay god says i want to live among them now please please note I, i'm making a point here that later on i will come back to God was not trying to bring men up to heaven because somebody might say heaven is God's dwelling place and they would be right. They would be right. But, but the, 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 the sanctuary was not God's way of bringing man into heaven. The sanctuary was God's way of bringing himself down to men. So that's a point that I, 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 I ask us to take note of. The, the whole meaning of the sanctuary the lesson we can take from the sanctuary is that god wanted to be with his people in a personal way and that is why he made the sanctuary now we, we noticed that the sanctuary itself was decorated in such a way that there were angels there were images of angels in the sanctuary for example on the on the mercy seat there was an image of two angels in the curtains and on the walls themselves, there were, there were carvings, there were, there were etchings, and there were embroidery of angels. Angels were embroidered into the curtains inside the sanctuary. So angels were represented. But notice the point of the sanctuary was that God himself wanted to be with the people. And remember that this was the type or the illustration. Here we are seeing lessons. And the lessons illustrate things that are real. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. There are some, some, some Christians, notably, again, Christians from maybe who, who have our persuasion in some things. There are, there are some Christians who make this sanctuary exclusively a representation of heaven. You, you will see the impact of this if you think about it. What they are saying is that God took heaven, God took something from heaven and put it down among the Israelites. And so this represents something in heaven. It has nothing to do with anything that God is doing here. And so when they think of the sanctuary, they never apply it to God's presence among us, but to God's presence in heaven. And this is why in their understanding, God himself is not here. God, whatever the sanctuary meant, 
God himself, it, it didn't mean God actually being here. It was a representation of heaven. But we will see that this was, this is a fallacious reasoning. In John chapter 2 and verse 19, this is the first time in the Bible that we ever see something like this. In John chapter 2 and verse 19, the Jews said to Jesus, let's start with verse 18. It says, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. This is the first time in the entire Bible that such an idea is presented. Nobody ever referred to his body as a temple. If you look at verse 21, it says, but he spake of the temple of his body. It's the first place in the Bible, as far as I can, can re recall or I can, I, I've, I've searched. It's the first place anybody ever looks at his body and refers to it as a temple. Now, when, when you look at this, the first thing you must realize is the purpose of the temple. That's why I started there. God told us specifically that the reason for a temple is that he might dwell among people. Now, for the first time, Jesus, Jesus points out to people that the body is, is a temple and a temple is the dwelling place of God. This is why the Jews rejected what he said. They were, they were so blind to what he said because nobody understood before. Nobody ever thought of it before. I suppose they were kind of like the Muslims. The Muslims think that it's blasphemy for you to think that God can live inside of, of your, your sinful being. And in fact, those are some of the arguments that people have presented in trying to counter this truth. They say, if God were to live inside of you, God would, would, would be living inside a, a, a sinful place. And, you know, this, this kind of reasoning used to make sense to me until I recognized that Jesus was the exact representation of God the Father, the exact expression. And Jesus mingled with sinners freely. They washed his feet. They leaned on his bosom. He ate bread with them. He was accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners. So the idea that God cannot live with sinners is a fallacy. It's not scriptural, unless we are going to say that Jesus was not the exact expression of God, the exact image of God. So it's foolishness. So the Jews said, the Jews thought he was talking about the temple, of course, because nobody understood that a person's body could be the dwelling place of God. It was the first time that this concept was ever expressed among humanity. Now, here's how I, 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 I view this. Way back in the beginning, before man sinned, Men and God were in perfect fellowship. I, I, I don't know exactly how close it was, but I believe, it, of course, we know it was unbroken fellowship. There were no barriers between men and God. In those, in those days of paradise, I don't know whether, I don't know how far this privilege went, but I know that God had face-to-face -face communion with men. And when this fellowship was broken, we often think of it from the perspective of man trying to find a way back to God, but that is wrong. That is wrong. That's a false per perspective. What the Bible shows us is that man was trying to escape from God. Men ran to hide. Men were not seeking God. Men did not wish to have communion with God. They were scared of God. You see it happening again at Mount Sinai. They didn't want God around them at all. That's what sin did. The truth is that from the beginning, it was God who was seeking man. It was our father who was trying to find a way to bring back that perfect beauty and harmony which existed at the beginning. That is a true perspective. And the whole purpose of God from that day until today, 6,000 years later, has been to perfect this restoration of man in his relationship to him, to, to him, to him God. So in, in Exodus 25 and verse 8, he said to Moses, step one, step one, make 
a house, make a tent, make a sanctuary, because I want to be among the people. Now, it, it, it was a type and an illustration, but, but there, was a, there was a striking lesson that God wanted to teach. And the first thing we can see is God's desire to be among those who are his people. First thing we can see, anybody who does not see this lesson, I mean, it is so, it is so ridiculous to believe that in the type, which the Bible tells us it was a shadow. It was a shadow of things to come. In the type, there was the living presence of the living God. And they say in the antitype, in the reality, God does not live with his people. God does not live with his people. It is some, it is some substitute that God, in, in, in what is supposed to be the antitype, the reality. There is no God. God, is, God and Jesus are billions of light years away. And we are left here with words and we are left here with the presence of angels. Whereas in the old covenant temple, there was the literal presence of, of, of God. We are told that Moses went into the, into the sanctuary and he spoke with God face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Now we know it, 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 he didn't really see the face of God. When it, when it says face to face, in fact, God, God used this phrase. God says mouth to mouth. In other words, he heard the voice of God and he answered and God answered and he spoke. They spoke back and forth like that as a man speaks with his friend. This was a privilege in the old covenant sanctuary in the type or the illustration in the shadow. And people want to say that in the real, in the real experience, in the new covenant experience, we don't have anything that is even close to that privilege. This is. Even just from that perspective, it is ridiculous. Now, in Acts 17 and verse 24, the Apostle Paul highlights something that I don't think they understood in the old covenant times, but Paul lived in the age when, when light had come and when reality had come. And Paul says in verse 24, Acts 17, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. All right, so, so what he's saying here is that God does not live in places made out of board and mortar and concrete and cement. God doesn't live in those places, okay? I, I, I think he really meant God is not confined to these places, but he was really addressing the misconception of people who believe that a temple was the dwelling place of God, and God was confined to that place. But here we see the reality that God is not limited to a particular place. But yet God said, make a sanctuary that I may live among them. There was a lesson that God wanted to teach. Now, if you, if you, if you grew up in, the, in Adventism, you know that every time you talked about the sanctuary, what they focused on was a sanctuary in heaven. And you know that Adventists always like to say that our message is a sanctuary message. It's a message of the sanctuary. People are still saying that all the time. And you, if you grew up in that tradition, you understand that there is a great deal of study that goes on about the sanctuary. I'm afraid a lot of it is going nowhere, right? That is my honest assessment after being involved in it for decades it's the same thing over and over and over again and it, it has boiled down it has come to be ju just dry legalistic expressions but but one thing i agree with and it is that the message of the sanctuary is critical god gave this illustration and there's a lesson in it but the problem is in in, in the in the emphasis that we see among adventists Everything is about the sanctuary in heaven. Everything is focused on the sanctuary in heaven. And the Bible teaches us that there is another reality that, in my opinion, is even more important. I'm not denying the fact that there's a heavenly equivalent because Paul says in Hebrews chapter 8, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 8 that, let me read it quickly. In Hebrews chapter 8, Paul says that Jesus is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. 
is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. And it goes on to talk in go down in about verse verses one to five. It says, These earthly priests served unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things. So anyway, the point is that there is the Bible does teach that there is a heavenly equivalent of what was on earth. And in Revelation chapter 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 eleven. The last verse says the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in the temple the Ark of the Covenant. And what it is showing us is that there is a heavenly equivalent of what was on earth. So I'm not denying this. But look at the New Testament and what you will see more prominently expressed is what we will read now. More prominently expressed. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Look at what it says. Know ye not. Don't you know? Ignorant people, don't you know that you are the temple of God? Specifically, the only place in the Bible that God ever told us what is the purpose of a temple is Exodus 25 and verse 8. And it says, the purpose of a temple is that I may dwell among them. The temple is the dwelling place of God. Paul says, you are the temple of God. You are the dwelling place of God. God lives in you, if I may put it another way. And the Spirit of God is living in you. This is what we see more prominently in the New Testament. If you look at um, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, it says it even more forcefully because look at what it says. It says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. It's recently the impact of this hit me because it says Paul doesn't just say you are the temple of God he says you are the temple of the living God there are many there are many ways that people try to express the reality of God and they say God comes to us through words and they say that the spirit of God is an agency from God and they say that the the the, the words of God are the mind of God and that is what we have but why does Paul say the living God. Why does he emphasize the living God? Sometimes as we, as we read the Bible, we need to take individual words and just ask ourselves the question, why did the writer put in this word? But Paul doesn't say you are the temple of God. He says you are the temple of the living God. He's adding an extra dimension just in case you miss the point. And then what does he do? He goes back to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament statements, and he goes to where God says, in the Old Testament, this is how it read, I will dwell with them. Notice the word with. Paul has changed the word. God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them or with them. Other verses, it says he will dwell with them. But Paul changes it. Because Paul understands something. Paul understands that in the New Covenant, there is a, a major difference. Whereas in the Old Covenant, God had says, I will dwell with them. Paul understands and he, he quotes the verse, but he changes a word. And he says, God has said, I will live in them. And I will walk, God said, I will walk among them. God says, Paul says, God says, I will walk in them. And this is the way how I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now. It's interesting, you know, those of you who are um, who are Adventists or ex-Adventists, you know that the Adventist church took some non-Trinitarian songs and changed them to the Trinity, right? For example, where it used to say, um, God over all who rules eternity. The, the present Adventist hymnal says, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And you, you take those words right and you break them down and you say, why did somebody change the words? This can't happen by accident. Somebody, nobody. All you have to do is take the, the, the old hymnal, take out the words and put them in the new hymnal. But somebody says, no, 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 no. They, they, they eliminate these words and they introduce a different set of words. This is deliberate and purposeful to make a point. Same thing Paul is doing here, but this time it's being, being done in a positive way. 
he changes the words of the Old Testament. The Old Testament says, I will dwell with them. Paul changes it and Paul says, I will dwell in them. How could anybody miss the point? Because when God says, I will dwell with them in the Old Testament, where was God? God's presence was manifested in the temple clearly and beyond question. There was a light in the temple, a supernatural light. It was not just words that were in the temple. It was not angels that were in the temple. It was God himself. And the Bible says Moses went in there and spoke to him face to face as a man speaks with his friend. So Paul takes the same statement and he applies it now to you and me as individuals and he says God has said I will live in them and he emphasizes your body is a temple of the living God what is he trying to say it's very difficult to misunderstand but there are some people who manage to do it as I say all the time they manage to do it because their minds have been blinded by idolatrous focus on human beings and so they fail to believe what the bible said you know i put up i put up a, a post on facebook where i quoted 10 verses from the bible that's all i did 10 verses to, that say that christ lives in me you, you know somebody came on and said somebody came on and said i'm a jesuit right somebody came on and said i'm a jesuit and and and, and that you know, somebody came to my, my defense and said, no, don't say that. That is not true. And the person was insisting, right? I'm a Jesuit for quoting the Bible. And I, I'm wondering, I wanted to use I wanted to use some harsh words in, in responding to this person. But, you know, I, I, I was tempted to use a word like idiot <laughs> and fool and, 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 and words like this. And, you know, I was reminded that I need to be temperate. The person may be really, I mean, you, you have to be some kind of real, yeah, idiot, I, I would say. Maybe it's not unjustified. But for quoting the Bible, for quoting the Bible, how can people be so blinded? How can people be so blinded? You know what their problem is? The 10 verses that I quoted, they say, I'm trying to destroy Adventism. I'm there to destroy Adventism. For quoting the Bible, Look here, if quoting the Bible is going to destroy your faith, it's time it is destroyed. It's time to destroy it. When quoting the Bible destroys your faith, it's time to destroy it. Because then it is as clear as day your faith is not a Bible-based faith. So what we can see here, the second great point I want to mention, remember the first point I wanted to emphasize is that the purpose of a temple is that it is a dwelling place of god and the second point i want to mention is that your body is identified in the new testament as a as a temple of the living god it's the new testament that brings out this 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 reality and i also want to add this to those two points which is that god has always been seeking to come closer to his people if you don't know this you don't know god God has always been seeking to come closer to his people. A person who is a legalist and law-oriented and who thinks that, that it is your works that endear you to God, they might disagree. They might disagree. But the people who know God and understand the grace of God in Jesus Christ, you know that our Heavenly Father has always been trying to find a way to come closer to his people. So bear this in mind along with those two things. A temple is the dwelling place of God. Your body is the temple of the living God. And God's purpose has always been he wants to get closer to his people, as close as possible. We human beings can understand this in, in, in our limited way, all right? When a man loves a woman, why is he so anxious to get married to her? You talk on the phone, all right, the, the furthest distance is that you sit and you dream. The next distance is that you start writing letters. When, 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 when my wife was in, when my girlfriend then was in Canada, I was in Jamaica. Three years she was gone. Every week or every two weeks I wrote a letter. Sometimes the letters took one month to get here. Man, I was like I was in an ant's nest. 
waiting to get my letter and I can't get it. Then the next level was that we could call by telephone. One time I called her, collect. And we talked for over an hour back in those days when, when the bill came, her mother was so upset, I never dared to call again. After that, it was just writing. But these days, now you can go to WhatsApp and you can go to Messenger and you, you have so many ways you can speak face to face. Is that enough? You know, Sister Natalie and Brother Arthur are getting married tomorrow. You can ask them if that is enough. Why do they want to get married? Why don't they just stay on, online and talk to one another? Okay? Love is always seeking to get closer. And you can understand how close you really want to be. That's what love is always seeking to do for the greatest intimacy with the one that you love. And if you say because that is erotic or emotional uh, or man-woman love, same thing with my children. My son was in, 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 in another island for 15 years working. You know what, you know what we, we look forward to? We look forward to the summer when he was coming home. We look forward to, to, to the Easter when sometimes he could come home. When he couldn't come home, sometimes there was a disappointment right through the family. Because it's different when you are you love somebody, you want to be with that person. Somebody will say, well, yes, that's why we want to be in heaven with God. And that is true. But is there a way that we can enjoy great fellowship before we actually get to heaven? If God could come down in the Old Testament sanctuary and live there so that he could be among his people, why wouldn't he do something similar for us today under the new covenant? especially when his word promises it over and over and over. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, I'm going to read a verse, and we have been very familiar with this verse. I, I'm just reminding us of it. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body may be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me point out something. Here, Paul mentions the human being as consisting of three parts. I am David, but I'm David with three parts, okay? Spirit, number one. Soul, number two. Body, number two. Number three. Now. I'm going to point out something. I'm going to ask you to look at this, this, this diagram. Let me. All right, let me see if I can get rid of the background image. You know, I think I better do this differently. I don't want to distract us with a lot of. All right, here we go. All right, can you see? All right, yes, okay. So what I, ha what, what I have on the screen is the layout of the sanctuary that God told the Hebrews to make. Now, everything, everything that God ever told people to do, it has a meaning. And one of the great deficiencies of, of, of the Christian faith is that people don't study the things that God told the Hebrews to do, because although we are no longer under the law, it is still full of tremendous meaning for God's people in this the gospel age. So this is this is the basic layout of the sanctuary. And I want to I, I was looking at this during the webinar on Thursday. Let me just quickly look at the uh, uh, remind us of the the different elements of the sanctuary. On the outside here in this light green rectangle, this was the yard or the courtyard. The white rectangle represents the sanctuary itself. And the sanctuary was divided into two apartments. If you look at the uh, about three quarters of the way up, you will see that light blue um, corrugated line going across. That represents the barrier between the two apartments. It was like a curtain. So you had two apartments inside the sanctuary and you had the courtyard. There were three sections to the courtyard, to, to, the, to the sanctuary. The yard, and then the two rooms. Now, I believe that when Paul talks about us being made up of body, 
and soul and spirit. It's similar. It's similar to the, the layout of the temple. Remember what God says. Remember that God tells us that your body is the temple of the living God. So in the temple, we are going to have a similar layout to the to the layout of the human soul. The human, the human, a human is made up of three parts: body, soul, and spirit. The temple was made up of three parts: courtyard, first apartment, second apartment. Notice that I have labeled these three apartments to correspond to the the human makeup. So the spirit, this yellow part here, this yellow part in the circle corresponds to this the, the, the most holy place of the sanctuary. This yellow, this light yellow rectangle are, are square. The soul, this blue part of the circle, your soul corresponds to the first apartment of the sanctuary. Unfortunately, I don't have it in blue. It's in pink. But the pink and the blue correspond. I believe that that part of the sanctuary corresponds to the soul of a person. And then the body, the red part in both diagrams represents the courtyard of the temple. So you have three parts to the human body. And those three parts are represented by the three parts of the sanctuary. So when God said, your body is the temple of the living God, we can look at our bodies, you can look at yourself, and you can see the three sections of the sanctuary. And when you understand this, there is some deep truth to be appreciated. <clears throat> My time is running and I realize that. <laughs> I, I'm kind of not even, I'm not even very far along the way of what I really want to say. So <clears throat> let me speed up a little bit. Now, let me go back to the first diagram that I was looking at and point out something. All right, notice that um, in the yard here, this square, this corrugated square here, that represented the altar of sacrifice. In your experience, it represents the time when you presented your body as a living sacrifice unto God. Notice that it, your, your body is presented when you are baptized, when you give yourself to God. All that people can see is the outside. <clears throat> and then th this labor here, this circle, it represented a place where the priest would wash. It represents baptism. After you give yourself to God, you are baptized in water. All of this is something that happens on the outside. So it's represented by the courtyard. The courtyard is where people can, <clears throat> can see what is going on. After that, we enter into this white rectangle. And this white rectangle represents the inner part of your being. The first apartment represents... <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Let me just get a little sip of water. <clears throat> <clears throat> this first apartment represents what we refer to as the soul and i'm going to i'm going to just explain that it represents your conscious mind it represents a thinking part of your body where where you have you, you have your decisions your emotions and then the the inner part here the, the, the innermost place the spirit represents the heart that place where your nature, your spiritual nature exists. I'm going to say more about this, so let me just Paul, uh, leave that for a moment. But if you look at the first apartment, let's look at this first apartment, the first room, and let us look at the things that are in it. As a matter of fact, let me, I have another diagram where I look at this in more detail. So let me go to that diagram. <clears throat> first apartment, you have the candlestick, you have 12 loaves of bread on the table of showbread, and you have the altar of incense. Now. Here is the thing, the showbread, the table of showbread represents the word of God. Everybody knows that bread represents the word of God. All right. So the people who say, the people who say that the word of God is inside of God's people, they are right. They are right because as we study the Bible, it is represented by the, the, the table with the 12 loaves of bread every week. They have to change this bread. 
So, so there was fresh bread every week, just like how you study the word of God, and your mind is being renewed by the word of God. So those who say it is the word of God inside of you, they are correct. However, they're also wrong because they say that this is, this is where it stops. The word of God is in our minds, in the soul, or in the holy place. But what about the most holy place? This is where they, they, they refuse to go any further. They are still living in the place of, 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 of the intellect. And they have not arrived at the place of the spirit. The first apartment is the intellect. It is the soul. It is not the spirit. The next thing that we see inside the soul are the first apartment is the candlestick. And here again, we see that the spirit of God is working on our minds. We are being renewed in our minds. Paul says, be not conformed to this world in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, but be, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word of God is working upon our int intellect. We are being, those, those old habits and old ideas are being changed as we feed on the word of God. And the spirit of God is applying this and changing our mental faculties. And so we are changing. And this is where some people are, uh, they stop. They are locked here and they don't go any further. So they believe we are being changed and we are being saved, but we are not saved because we are still not perfect. And this is a struggle and sometimes we fail and sometimes we succeed. And because they are, they, they are usually the legalists who believe that if you fail, you are lost. They live in a state of constant fear because their religion exists in the first apartment. It is a thing of the soul. It is not something of the spirit. And that is their problem. If you go to the next thing that was there, there was the altar of incense. And here again, you have daily prayer. You have conscious, you have, you have, you have a place of conscious interaction with God. How do you consciously interact with God? It happened to me this morning while I was praying. I went and I consciously spoke to God and I mentioned certain things. One sister asked us last night to pray for the people in India. I was praying for the people in India. Um, I, I am relating to God on a conscious level. That's what is represented by the worship in the soul. There was also the offering of incense. And of course, that is, that is transparent and easy to understand. Everything is suffused, is infused with the righteousness of Christ. Even in our conscious minds, there's an awareness of Christ. We come to God in Jesus' name. And that's why we are, we, are, we are accepted. And that's why we have a right, because we come in Jesus. But, as I said, this is where these brethren stop. If this was all that there was to the makeup of a person, if this was all that there was to the sanctuary, they would have a point. But look here. The most holy place. The most holy place. There is another apartment to the sanctuary and there's another apartment to you, the person. When the Bible says that your body is a temple of the living God, what specifically is Paul speaking about? Let me read a couple of verses before I look at the next. Um, before I look at the next diagram. All right, let me minimize this first of all. Bring up my Bible. No? All right, I have to close this and then go back to the Bible. Sorry about that. Back to the Bible. All right. In the most holy place, look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 22. He says, look at what he says specifically. The Lord Jesus Christ be where? The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Does Jesus live inside your intellect? The only way Jesus lives inside your intellect is, 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 is by studying his word. So the people who are locked into the first apartment, they say that we have the words of Christ. This is true. It is words that live in your, in, in your intellect. And that is why in, in, your, in your intelligent mind, you are up sometimes and you are down sometimes. And sometimes you doubt and sometimes you believe because your, in, your intellect is based on information. 
It's not based on life, it's based on information. And yes, information is important because information helps you to begin to change your ways and change your attitude. You begin to grow in, in, in the knowledge of Christ. So it's important, but it is not the place of salvation. Otherwise, you'll be saved today and lost tomorrow as the information comes and goes. The place where Jesus Christ himself lives is in your spirit. In your most holy place, that is the apartment where nothing changes. Nobody can enter into that apartment except God. And I'm going to show you that Jesus is in there as well. In the type and the illustration, God was clearly there. I'm going to show you that Jesus was clearly there also. Look at what Jesus says here. The people said to Jesus, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, but as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say unto you, verily, verily, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gave it to you, and my father is giving you the true bread from heaven. Now look here, please understand, when Jesus said this, did the Jews have the word of God? Absolutely, they had the word of God. They had the word of God for thousands of years, and yet they did not have the true bread from heaven. The word of God, as written in the Bible, is not the true bread from heaven. And I will repeat that the Bible is not the true bread from heaven. The Bible is a guide to take you to the true bread from heaven. And so Jesus made it clear when Jesus says, For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The bread of God never came from heaven till Jesus arrived. Read the verse. Those of you who are listening to this or watching this and you, have, you are skeptics, read the verse and understand what Jesus is trying to say. Don't let preconceived ideas blind your minds to reality. The bread from heaven, and notice what this bread from heaven was. What was the type of this bread from heaven? heaven it was the manna our fathers ate manna in the desert and jesus said i am the true manna i am the bread that came from heaven my father is now giving you the true bread from heaven not manna the true bread from heaven so i'm, I'm going to go back to um to my screen here give me a second i think i think i close out my diagram so let me just open them back um because I want to show you, I want to show you how clear the Bible is. All right, back to my. Okay, good. In the most holy place, in, 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 there, there was, first of all, the most noticeable thing was that there was a, a golden box referred to as the ark of the covenant well actually it wasn't the most noticeable thing let me show you something else that was there that was even more noticeable look at this above that golden box there was a supernatural light i think if you went into that room you wouldn't even see the box the first thing you would see is that light and if you survived if you happened to be the high priest and you came with incense you would live but you would see that light I don't even think that this priest, this image of the priest we see over here, I don't think he would be looking up like that. He'd be holding down his head because he'd be scared to death to be in that presence. There was a presence in that room. The box was secondary. The, the primary thing was the presence in that room, the light that was there. This was the manifested presence of God Almighty. So if your body is the temple of the living God, what does that light represent? What does that light represent? There was bread in the first apartment, but here in the most holy place representing the spirit or the heart. What is this light representing? The presence of God was here. What is the equivalent in the new covenant? How can anybody, how can anybody say it is not God himself? I'll tell you more. Look at the other implements that we can find here in this whole, in this most holy place. Pot of manna. What did the manna represent? Hold on a second. 
God told Moses specifically to get a pot of manna and to put it inside the ark. Same place where the Ten Commandments were, where God's presence is manifested. Inside of it, they were to put a, a pot of the manna. Now, remember that if you put down the manna, overnight it would spoil and breed worms and they put a pot of it inside of the ark of the covenant and it never spoiled century after century it never spoiled what does the manna represent jesus told us we just read the verse jesus says i am the what the living bread that came down from heaven the scripture already told us your body is the temple of who? The living God. And so we see the living God because the light is there, the shining light. And here we see the living bread. Jesus and the Father are represented in the most holy place in your spirit. It is the Father and the Son. So don't anybody come and stop in the first apartment and try to, def and, and try to define our experience by the first apartment experience. We are made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Soul-oriented religion never saves anybody. It only turns you into a legalist fixated on words and ideas and theories. Living Christianity is in the spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that is what we see in the temple. Your body is the temple of the living God. In the most holy place is the living presence of the living Father and the living bread, the Son of God. You who want to study, you who want to study the sanctuary, don't you hear the lesson of the sanctuary? You people who say that your message is a sanctuary, don't you understand? And I'm not talking to anybody in this room. I'm just reeling a little bit. And I, I, I know that there are people who, who, Amen, who, who will watch. Amen, brother David. Amen, brother. Yes, yes, brother Ralph. Amen, indeed. I just know there are people out there who will watch and criticize and condemn. And I just feel like, what can I do to get these people to be honest in looking at the word of God? Don't you hear the word of God? Can't you see how clear it is? There was also inside of this most holy place. What is this? Yes, it's the Anita. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Noisy. I'm going to ask you now or later. Ask so me later. Yes, yes, because there's a lot of noise. Okay. Can we wait till the sermon is finished? Then we ask questions, please. Yeah, that, that, that's what she said, Brother Raymond. She said she will wait. So, okay. What else do we see inside there? We see God told Moses to put Aaron's rod that budded. Now, now the thing about this rod, you you know that there were there were some other people who claimed that they had just as much right as Aaron. And God told them that they are the leaders of Israel. God told them to bring their rods. A rod is a little piece of stick that is dry and, and, and that you walk around it for years. And it, it has been dead for decades. All of them had their rod. And God says, bring your rods and put them before the Lord in the temple. They brought their rods, the 12 of them plus Aaron's rod. In the morning, Aaron's rod was budding and it was bearing flowers and it was growing leaves. The dry stick began to bear. And God says, take it and put it in the ark to be a testimony for future generations. What does it represent? It's clear, isn't it? What can make a dry stick live again? It is to be born again. Where are we born again? We are born again in the spirit. Aaron's rod in, in the most holy place represented the rebirth of the spirit. That is where you have become a new creation. Not in your brain, not in your soul. In your soul, the process is still taking place. But in your spirit. There is God, there is, the, 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 there, there is Jesus, the living bread, and there is the new birth. There's the born again spirit. Brothers and sisters, it's not a joke that we are the temple of the living God. What again is there? In the side of the ark, there were the other commandments. And what does this represent? Because, okay, let me go up a little further. You also have the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. And we understand that the Ten Commandments were an, an expression of the character of god we understand that in here we not only have 10 commandments we have the nature of god our spirits have been transformed by being united to the to, to the lord and to and to his son and the promise is fulfilled where god says a new heart will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you instead of giving you 10 statements written on stone god gives you everything by giving you a new nature 
So everything that this stone was talking about is already in your spirit, plus much more. You don't live by written instructions. You live by the impelling of a new nature. This is in your spirit. But also, also, there is also not just moral renewal, but there's something else because in the side of the ark, all the other instructions were put. Now, let me go back quickly to the Bible to, um, to highlight what this represents. And probably when I'm, uh, I've done that, I'm going to um, stop because my time is up. But if you go back, if you go back, right. You will see where God said in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 6. Look at what God says concerning these laws that were in the side of the ark. He says, keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of these nations. What God was saying was that if you keep these other laws, it would demonstrate that you are wise in your business dealings, in your relationship with other people, in, all, in obeying all these rules, in your health practices and everything. You would, you would be wiser than other people. Where does that wisdom exist in the born again Christian? Let me show you. What did these laws in the sight of the ark represent? They were still in the most holy place. They were still in the spirit. What does it represent in reality? First Corinthians 2, look at this. I'll start from verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. These, the, these things, these, these elements of wisdom, they are spiritually discerned. True wisdom is spiritually discerned. But look, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. You can judge any issue, anything, as we walk in the spirit, but nobody can stand in judgment on you. Why? Why? Because the statement says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Who can teach God? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the wisdom of Christ. Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. We have the mind of Christ in our spirits. So, so even when you are doing your business affairs, brothers and sisters, even when you are making your ordinary decisions in the, in, in the world, if you will walk in the spirit and listen to the Lord leading you from within, you will be far wiser than anybody else because we have the mind of Christ. We know things that you cannot learn by, by studying. That's what Paul says earlier on. He says, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received the spirit of the world, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of, of God. We know things that we have never learned because it says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But we know. We know what we have not studied because the Spirit of God is teaching us. So, I'm aware that I'm starting to hurry a little bit because I'm aware that I've run out of time. But um, I'm going to stop here. Again, you know, I, I feel like I, I, I've spent a little bit of time railing a little bit and ranting a little bit, I, I feel very strongly, honestly, the burden. I don't know. I don't, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not interfering with people, but I'm a Christian, and so are you, okay? We're ambassadors for Christ, and we're a part of his business, and it is burdensome to see that darkness is being disseminated in the name of Jesus Christ. Even people who, who claim to believe the truth about God have gone into this abysmal darkness and they are denying what is so clearly taught in the Bible. I wanted to share this morning because I wanted to remind us, for those of us who might not think, who might question, is our case really that strong? I'm saying, look at the sanctuary. Look at the central element of the Jewish faith and remember that the central element of our faith is Christ in you. How strong is our argument? How strong is the basis of our conviction? How much evidence is there for us to be certain of what we believe? And I'm saying, when you look at the sanctuary itself, 
the parallel is striking. It's not by accident. God put all of these things there to give us faith. Your body is the temple of the living God. And I pray that this may not be just an argument for us to debate about, but it, that it is something that we experience in our lives.